So I w- want to start off today. I mean, we're gonna gonna jump off into any any topics or anything like that. Main thing today is just say what comes to your mind, right? Because we want it to be genuine. It's not a rehearsed deal or anything else like that, right? So, um, so with that being said, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about your history? Um, I guess even before you joined the AB, because you had experience in the industry kind of different part of the industry, but experience in the industry before you joined EAB. And then here at EAB, you've kind of done a little bit of everything. So why don't you give us, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say a brief, but I mean, tell tell us, you know, where you've worked and what you did and what your career progression looked like here at EAB. Yeah. So what I would start off saying is when someone on a job site says, how long have you been doing this? And I tell them, as soon as I could pick up a tool bag, I've been doing air conditioning work. And so I'm a, a son of an air conditioning business owner, and I grew up doing uh, residential work and, and progressed through that um, and uh, decided through working through my father's company that uh, I wanted to go to school. I didn't want to be in someone's attic for the rest of my life. Uh, so I pursued that uh, mechanical engineering degree, and uh, Galen came out to uh, the university at a career fair, offered me a job, and um, that's how I got brought on board um, and that was 22 years ago um, it's I think it's a rarity in any industry for someone to have the ability to feel comfortable and stay so long at, at a company um, I've within the company I've had a very unique experience that others may have not had is that I've worked in pretty much every market and everything that we work in I've I've progressed from small capital projects within the med center and worked that for seven years in and out with all the clients down there in that one mile circus, circus, I said circus, but it is, (laughs) um, but, uh, but let's back up though, because even in your first couple of years that you were here, yeah, it seemed like small jobs, but you did that whole big med school job. I mean, I mean that that was that was a big project. It was just done in small pieces, right? Yeah, and uh, manageable bites of that that med school project was a larger project. <clears throat> it reoutfitted 500 labs or more yeah. with a very complex lab configuration, tracking multiple hoods, um, uh, temperature loopouts, um, yeah. all of all of the all the bells and whistles that comes with doing labs. And that really gave me a good foundation of understanding pressurization and, and all of that. Um, And it was done over a period of about three years at 10 rooms a piece Mm -hmm. a a month. And so, yeah, that, that seemed more manageable at the time because I was only doing. It seemed like a bunch of small projects, but it was really part of of a much larger project. Yeah. So, yeah, did those those things served a bunch of clients down there. Um, once the opportunity came, and uh, some of the clients we had were building satellite facilities, I was able to step onto a bigger project and do a bigger role, and and you know start doing bigger new construction, full build hospitals, and I did that for a fair amount of time. That's Methodist West Houston. Methodist West Houston, yeah. And uh, that project went off really well. I was uh, afforded the opportunity to work with Austin Commercial and with um, Paige, I think, at the time, um, where um, Bill, that works with us now, yeah, he was he was a design lead. He on that was project. the design lead on that project. Yeah, and uh, so. Everyone was receptive to the feedback I was giving them. They felt comfortable with the practical experience that I was saying, hey, this looks like we could make a better attempt at um, getting a building DP to control for chill water loops, for stairwell pressurizations, reconfiguring the the ductwork so that the, the stairwell filled out more evenly and you didn't have local high pressure areas where we would uh, fail a door door pool so that was some of the challenges that we worked through that project yeah that one was full of of challenges and opportunities for excellence right 
Um, no, so so when you when you finish that project, is that when you join the commissioning team? No, I, I didn't join the commissioning team at that point. Um, there were a few other jobs that came came along, and then the um, the MSC in College Station came. Yeah, you you did do that. So the, tell us about that job because that was a big that was a large career defining project as well. Yeah, um, and it's and it's even transitioned into a long standing relationship that you have with an with an owner client. Yeah, so the. At that time, there were young um, project managers for Texas A&M Systems there, and we we got on board for that project for the MSC, which is the Student Center for Texas A&M. I don't know what the stats are of the job, but it was it was a year and a half to com- complete the whole project in itself. And while doing that project, we were able to pick up some of the other uh, buildings around campus at the same time, which pretty much kept me busy for for two years straight, 100% in College Station area, working with that client and, uh, you know, making sure that we um, kept them as a client and we're still preferred. Um, Texas A&M Systems, anytime that they have uh, master spec conversations or um, what do you think pricing structure should you be for this test, they, they come to us and ask us what our opinion and not only do they take it into consideration, but often they use our feedback to alter the way that they handle their projects. Sure, sure. So you went from the MSC, where'd you go after that? So after the MSC, then I started doing commissioning work. Mm -hmm. I worked um, primarily and went back to the med center at UT MD Anderson and we're doing projects for commissioning. At that time, commissioning was defined, but some of the processes and tests that we uh, we use today weren't in place. So yeah, it was the early days. The early days. We were talking with Josh about that. It was a little bit of the Wild West. We were, we were really having to come up with things on our own. And in, in that moment is when uh, I would say the light bulb came on to me about total process of construction, understanding the ins and outs about all of the, the MEP systems, life safety, nurse call, mm-hmm. um, it just really opens your eyes to all of the different um, things that go into a project. So we were we were at that point creating system verification checklists. They didn't exist. So we, if we got a system we hadn't seen before, a uh, domestic water skid, we had to write a yep, write a write a not only write the sequence verification. I mean, excuse me, functional test, pre-functional test. Yeah. W- we call it something different. We'd have to write that, but we'd also have to write the functional test at the same time. Um, and through that year and a half, we started to get some some very good procedures down. Now Josh is amazing at that. Everything is very, very organized and um, has standard formatting where you, within that software, you build a system tree and it pretty much populates all the standard yep. um, documents you need for that project. It's come a long way since then. Yeah, we were just talking about that with him. So when once you, you you did commissioning for it was about two years, year and a half, two year, years. Okay. And then where'd you go from there? So year and a half, two years takes by. I'm getting the feel of it, feeling good, feeling like this is probably something that I I could stay and do. And uh, opportunity came for me to 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 be brought on to the Exxon Mobil campus project. Yeah, that was probably one of the largest combined tab projects that we've ever done here in Houston, I think. It was the largest single site multi-building job going on at the time, hands down. In the whole country. In the whole yeah, country. Absolutely. Yeah. And certainly, I mean, it was a lot of different contracts, but I think if we aggregated them together, it was probably one of the largest tab scopes we've ever had in the history of the company. Yes, sir. Yeah. It started out as a $2 million deal and when we finished, it was a $4 million deal. Yeah. So, um, tell, tell us about some of the challenges and some of the things you learned on that project. Cause you had to step in, we had some, you know, manpower changes from the leadership of that project at the time. And you really had to step in and, and pick up that job. And I don't, I don't think it, up to that point you had ever run anything that big. So that was, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you had at that point. And, and, you know, you went from, 
you know, basically working in commissioning where it's almost, you know, individuals or, or we had a pretty small team even back then during commissioning to one, what was the max manpower we had on that Exxon project during the head, during the height of it. So sustained for three years, we had 16 people on the job. Yeah. At the max, we, we had 20. Yeah. So quite a bit to keep up with, um, running in different buildings, um, different contractors, all working under the same kind of umbrella with a very, obviously a very challenging client, right? Right. So there was 23 buildings going up simultaneously, all served by one central plant loop. Yep. And um, two general contractors had to go in together to pair to get to get um, to get the job, and there were three sets of mechanical companies within those um, sections of the campus. They yeah. split it up into f four campus sections. Is how they were building and putting teams as far as managing the project. So what do you think are some things on that project, number one, that help define the role you do today, but number two, um, also defined, I guess, you know, why EAB is different? Because there were other there were other tab firms working on that job. So we there obviously were some differences that were observed even on that project overall, right? So let's, t let's try to talk about both those things. <laughs> So when talking about this, you really get into some of the differences with EAB, and the first thing is initiative. If we see something that's going on and we think we can improve the process, even if it's not directly related to our day-to-day -day test and balancing, we go ahead and bring it up to the owner and, that, and the construction team of, hey, I, I see, a, I see a, an avenue of improving our process and becoming a, a more efficient team to meet the, the end goal of this project. And so that initiative, that, that owner mentality, that ownership mentality of this, this, this facility sort of belongs to us. You know, it represents us and who we are and what we're doing for this client. So we want to we want to do it to the best of our ability. Yeah. Whereas other tab firms are there just to do their job, to get in and out and not to get their, um, their, staff involved with too many things outside of testing airflow. Okay. So, you know, in, in your role there on that project, that, I mean, that, that was good, right? I mean, that was a, that was a tough project and, and there, and we, and let's face it, I hate to say this on, on a mic, but the project team we were working with did not have as much appreciation for EAB as what others may, right? Is that a fair statement? Right. There's There were two camps out there, and um, each of them had their strengths and each of them had their weaknesses. Um, uh, what I what I want to touch on is, so these are well-established, um, big general contracting companies, and they use their resumes uh, to get out there and to get these jobs. They staff that facility with mainly people that were just getting out of college to do the in and out day to day work and a few key people that had experience but the vast majority of those people within those general contracting they didn't have very much experience so we were able to help them understand MEP systems and a lot of those people today are out in the industry um, they're shakers and movers in the industry and now we we cultivated that relationship we helped them develop when they were put in that tough situation under tight deadlines to complete a building with very little training from their own uh, company and now they're out there doing great things in the industry um, i think that uh, that was a very unique thing to have such a big job and the day-to-day -day thing the day-to-day -day activities me realizing that yeah, I'm the most experienced person at the table at the moment. Yeah, on such a large project, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. So, ended up being successful and things like that. So when you when we finally finished that project, um, like you said, it was over a three year period. It seemed like it was never going to end. Um, where'd you go after that? Oh no, nah, comes to mind. Yeah. So after that, we had a conversation, and it there was an opportunity within the K through. 12 market 
went and serviced a few specific clients. Um, and that would have been what geographically we have divided in the past is anything north of I-10 in the K through 12 market, I was going to cover and be the project manager for. Um, large change of pace. Okay. What do you mean by that? I'm used to deadlines, project finishing, and having a functional building. That's what you had experienced previously in the med center. In the med center. Healthcare clients, healthcare. critical environments, things like that. Yeah. What's different in K-12? through So what's different in I'm K- so glad you're bringing this up because I was trying to figure out a way to do it. So what's different in K-12 through is um, they have a bond, they have a budget, and they have to get the jobs built for the – for the budget they have. What that lends itself to is a different tier of contractor. And um, it's cyclical, meaning that the summers are crazy and the rest of the year, maybe not unless you're doing roundup work. Um, but so the quality of the, the, the subcontractors change. Um, they were not responsive to on-site during a project MEP coordination from us. Not that we're an MEP coordinator, but we're trying to help them get their job done. Yeah, we're doing what we normally do and try to make the project successful. And it's not always well received, right? It wasn't well received and um, they they simply don't have the amount of people and the amount of trained people to execute the projects during the project schedule. So what generally happens is the majority of our work is after the fact, after occupancy. So we'll, we'll c- a project schedule for a school, we, we won't have any real durations built into t- their schedules. And we'll do our best to get started on it, but it, it really occurs, our bulk is when everyone else is demobilizing. And once someone has already left off the job, it's really hard to get them out there to get anything done sure sure challenging market um so that that market is built on off of heavy network network your networking ability better be pretty good if you're going to be successful in that market so i'm going to ask you this because we've uh i would say the eab across the whole company and especially here in our houston market we've been very successful in the k-12 through market and you just described some challenges that most people would not normally associate with the types of projects EAB works on, right? So you've been, you know, working on managing K through 12 projects and now you really oversee that whole market segment in addition to higher ed here in the Houston marketplace. Um, Why do you think we're so successful in the K through 12 market? Um, We're successful across the board and I'll tie into my out of state experience. When we visit other complete out of out of state markets they cannot believe the the culture that the guys that are in the field bring to the job okay quality individuals um you know that that core values really rings true it's not something that um i don't think that you can you can refine it but the people that we're hiring are those people to begin with. They yeah, it's ha- inherent to our to to everybody that's on our team. So that that stands out amongst amongst anything else is every person that they come in contact with is that that higher level and we're always working with the team to encourage them to be at that high level to strive for excellence. They might not want to uh, drink when you lead them to water, but we're across the board trying to bring that that level up. Sure, sure. From an owner's perspective, why do you, cause primarily, you know, and this has been long before we were able to kind of achieve that direct to owner relationship. We've had it in the K through 12 markets. Um, and not even just here in Houston, it's been, you know, in the, in the Dallas Fort Worth area, um, and I would say even in the San Antonio markets. Um, why do you think that the owners like EAB? Why, why do they choose to? Because honestly, you know, if you look at it from the outside perspective, sometimes we drag their projects out a little bit. Sometimes we actually make them work a little harder 
But why do you think they hire EAB? What's different about our firm? So when you hire EAB, you're buying peace of mind. You go home at night. If you're working as a project manager, as an owner, you go home, you sleep well. Your project's being taken care of by EAB. There's no question about it. People might not like what we say, but they don't ever argue because 99% of the time we are a facts base reporting company. We don't get into um, he said, she said. We just prov provide the facts, give the information, look out for the owner's interest, and that peace of mind is why they hire us. Be because if they call us, we come. We fix the problems. We're, we're able to fill in and, and be the bridge between the owner, the architect and engineering team, the construction team, and the subcontractors. And they don't work all in unison and harmony. Each of them, they all have their different set of vocabulary, understanding, and different currency of what will motivate them to work together to get something done. Um, and they, the owners see that, that they're just, they're gonna get a thorough product, they're gonna get a working project, um, their, their end user is gonna be comfortable, and usually their warranty period is, is, is pretty stress-free. Not a lot of hot and cold calls, not a lot of alarms on their building automation system. Everything is functioning the way it was designed and intended to work. Okay, well, that's good. So, so some of those things that, I mean, that, that market's very, very unique, right? Um, and I don't know that you can specifically attribute some of the things that we say are difference points with EAB, right? I think it's a combination of a, a bunch of different things because the market is unique, as, you, as you've said. But you know, we like to talk about what makes EAB different, okay? Um, and we put a lot of time and, and effort into trying to define that because everybody knows. I mean, if you talk to our clients, you talk to the people we deal with in the industry, it doesn't matter whether it's in the K-12 market, healthcare market, um, higher ed, whatever it may be, people will say EAB is different. Um, and they'll give you a, a number of reasons why EAB is different. We've hit on a lot of those you know, here today, even with you and with others, right? Um, but we really tried to quantify what that is. And one of the things that we came up with is it's thought leadership. Um, you know, and, and so here at EAB, we, we, I won't say we coined that term, but we certainly use it. And so I'm going to ask you, what, what do you think thought leadership is and why is it important? So thought leadership to me is thoughtful leadership. Um, and I'm not sure what direction to take it, but when we have a person that achieves project manager at EAB, we've homegrown that talent from A to Z. They're capable of doing anything across the board within um, what services we provide. Not many companies have that availability. They usually hire in. Um, they promote people that might not be really trained and ready, and they have gaps in their leadership, so they can't they can't really provide that thoughtful leadership to understand what it takes to do a project from beginning to end because okay. they don't have the tool set. What about our involvement in the industry and, and things like that outside of just our operations? So when you go to AABC conference and you speak with other firms within the conference and you understand some of the things that they're doing and procedures, we're, we're, we're a mark above. We are always on the cutting edge of trying to um, work with the latest technology, come up with the, the most concise way to test with repeatable results. And um, you know, I'm kind of lost in my thoughts there, but... Uh, what about training? <laughs> oh yeah, training. <laughs> um, Training is unbelievable here at EAB. Um, 
you come in as a technician in training and you're given someone that a direct mentor that you're going to work with that is very well very well trained theirself and they're going to be that mentor to you and that you're going to get that every day of the week when you're in the field but you're also going to get um the once a month training specifically that go over um some of the ins and outs of uh, maybe how to analyze things better in the field and troubleshoot um you're going to go through through those those things on a on a reoccurring monthly training in person um with people that are dedicated and knowledgeable to train and on top of that we have this state of the art facility um of a laboratory and training center and we have um courses built that I've never seen before. I don't know that they exist anywhere else. I've gone to a few testing facilities and um quite honestly it's like back of the stage kind of disorganized operation. They might get a casing test done on an air handler for uh, demonstrating to a client, but there's no way it's they can execute. More, more of an R&D lab, which obviously we have here, but it's nothing purpose-built for it's training. It's no purpose-built training out there in the industry. Yeah. Okay. I don't see it. So a couple other things that we talk about, um, and we've hit on some of them. I mean, I, I mean, you've already kind of, we talk about project leadership and we talk about ownership mentality. I think you've already kind of talked through some of those things, yeah. when we're t- especially when we're talking about Exxon. Um, practical experience though is another one, right? Um, you know, our company's obviously the oldest and, and largest in North America, you know, privately owned. I have to say that now. And, uh, all with that comes a tremendous amount of experience. So what, what does practical experience mean to you? And why do you think it sets the AB apart? What is practical experience to me? So you can learn a technique and if you don't use it, you'll lose it. So we use it, it becomes a skill. And after you've done that skill for a certain amount of time, it it becomes almost wisdom, not not even just practical experience you're you're wise applied knowledge you have mastered um hvac testing and balancing and we have guys that have been here 40 years that have taught to this point now a couple of generations of people on how to do this so our practical experience is is off the charts we have applied knowledge we know how everything works in a project and um i'm not seeing it out in the industry anywhere if if i'm not a design engineer but i can tell you if a design problem comes up in a project meeting i can provide you with immediate feedback i don't have to say let me get back to you i'll look into that the experience we have provides our guys with that kind of knowledge and experience. Okay. We can give immediate feedback to problem resolution. And, uh, there's more than one way, um, to get something done, but our guys can also, um, keep that in mind when they're, they're providing those solutions. They're, they're aware of also the like cost factor. And so they'll give you multiple ways of achieving the same goal. And, um, that's what I think uh, where we are the different as far as experience. Okay. Um, so I've got one final question Yeah. for you. What do you love about EAB? Oh, man. The people are what make EAB EAB. The, the guys, the camaraderie amongst each other, the feeling of a family, a work family, is the difference. 